Hello, everyone. Welcome to the How to Get More Clients and Make More Money webinar. I'm Glenn James, and I'm joined by the wonderful Laura from La La Social Club. Hello, Laura. Hello, Glenn. How are you today? Good. I'm very good. That now, is good. can I just, while we're getting settling, and welcome if you've uh, if you've just arrived, um, just raise your hand if you can hear myself. Just because um, we like to do this. Yep, there's lots of hands raising. <laughs> Love it. And Laura, if you can just tell everybody a little bit about yourself while I lower everyone's hands. Lower everyone's hands. Um, my name's Laura. I run a company called Lala Social Club and I essentially am a marketing consultant. So I teach people how to actually show people how to get better results from their marketing and to cut through the noise with their marketing. Um, and I work with a lot of small business owners. So I'm really excited about tonight because I feel like if there's people who are starting their own business or doing a side hustle and want to kind of take it to the next level, I'm really excited because I feel like there's going to be some fun, good tips for all of you. Yeah. So I'm going to have a, a lot of fun with everyone tonight. Laura, you're a lot of fun. Thanks for coming. And just everyone raise your hands if you could hear Laura loud and clear as she was explaining herself because we just want to make sure the audio is fine. Nath, I was, and thanks to Nath um, for working back tonight, I was getting a little echo of Laura somewhere. I don't know where that was coming from. Could you hear? Yeah, one, two. Oh, you know what? It's in the headphones. We'll turn them off. Okay. Uh Uh-huh. That's fixed it. <laughs> We're just trying to nail the technology, everyone. If you've joined our webinars before, we've, we've actually ordered some lapels, but they're not because of COVID, everything's delayed. So let's, um, what we're going to do, I'll get Nate to flick back over to our uh, slide. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Dark and Jung people, the traditional custodians of the land of which our studio sits, and pay respects to their elders past and present. We extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us tonight. Now, this is the agenda, and we want to make this as interactive as possible. The Q&A is open. The chat is open. Um, But I'm going to start by discussing... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I'm going to talk about how you're positioning your business. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about making a, a smooth customer experience. We're going to talk about a bit of a giveaway we're doing tonight. Laura's going to have a chat about some branding and DIY marketing strategies. I'm looking forward to that because we can all learn always. And we'll answer, I've, I've selected some questions that you've sent in. Uh, we've got some live polls as usual. And if you ask a question on the Q&A, remember everyone to upvote that and upvote your, I guess, most popular favorite questions. And while we're just getting settled and people are finding their seat, I'm just going to put the first poll up tonight just to see where everyone's coming in from. Um, And this will help you understand how the polling thing works. Uh, What's your nearest capital city? We've got Oh, wow. Shout out to the 3% of people in Hobart, the 2% of people in yes. in Canberra. No one in Radelaide yet or Darwin. So we'll end the poll. I think as well, if everyone can get used to the polling, we'll just let the polls go for 35 seconds and then I'll share the results. If you are watching this replay on YouTube or our My Millennial uh, Replays podcast of the audio, you won't see the poll, uh, but you'll certainly hear it. Um, so I've ended the poll. Sharing the results so everyone can see the results. Uh, 26% in Sydney, 25% in Brisbane, 36% in Melbourne. I guess no one has got anything else to do. Can't go anywhere at the moment. Um, And the rats and mice of the percentages are scattered all around Australia. So there we go. So if we go back to the slides, our recommendations for tonight is to be encouraged. We want you to just be encouraged. I want you to always, any anytime you go to an event, uh, to a, a webinar, whatever your thing is, um, look for one thing. That Just look for the one gem. You take 15, awesome. But if you can just look for the one thing and then finally take action. Look for that one thing, implement it, and you'll certainly get the most bangeth for your bucketh. So, Laura, I want you 
um, to just tell us a little bit about your online course, and it's on the screen now, uh, My Marketing Playbook. So everybody, if you want to take a screenshot of this, and we'll put it up at the end or a photo, tell us about this course. Yeah, so My Marketing Playbook is, I launched this in last month actually, and it's essentially my online course for small business owners um, or people who are starting their business and it really is there to help you to get really good at marketing. And my whole background has been working one-on-one with a lot of um, business owners. And the one-on-one coaching I was providing for people, um, I w- kind of got to a point where I was like, actually, a lot of these startup, smaller companies can't actually afford the one-on-one um, kind of that kind of engagement. So I put together this course of pretty much everything I'm doing with a one-on-one client anyway. And it's really easy to follow step-by-step frameworks on everything you need to really market your business and grow your business from scratch. So it's really practical. And also you've got a a Canva kit as well. And we'll put links up and all that at the end. Uh, But tell us a little bit about... um, this kit because we will refer back to these things throughout the night. Yes. Um, the Canva template pack has, we just launched this last week and it is, it has gone crazy actually. And what it is, is essentially everything you'd need. It's like brand guide from scratch. And I know a few people have asked um, questions before the webinars even started about branding. Um, we've put together a brand guide where you just drag and drop your colors in, your fonts, everything's ready to go. There's mood boards, there's Instagram story tiles, um, tiles for your Instagram feed. We've even got an ebook template, which has like been the mm. favorite. Um, so if you wanted to put together a proposal doc, you could use that. Or if you're wanting to do an ebook, you can use that as well. So much stuff, Instagram highlight covers. We've kind of got Pretty well everything I, I think. So don't you'd need. spend thirty seven hundred dollars, spend thirty seven dollars. Thirty seven <laughs> bucks. It's a bargain. It's um yeah, and Canva's awesome. So I love it and I think if you're starting out, honestly, it's a real game changer. And if you're wanting to DIY a lot of your marketing, then this is really gonna help yeah. you to do it without throwing your computer out the window, which is important. <laughs> it is. Now Whitney asked a question, um, mistakes you've made and learned from as business owners yourselves. I don't know if I'm reading that wrong and I don't know if I've accidentally misspelt her name. I thought it was a double T. So I thought, (laughs) Laura, (laughs) what do you think like was a a number one mistake you learned in business and well, what did you make and how did you learn from it? I guess I'll okay. say. Okay. Do you know what? I've made this mistake a couple of times, but I remember the first time I made this mistake, I ended up calling you. And I don't know even know if you remember this. I had just started out and I was managing people's social media and I signed this huge account and I was like so excited. It was awesome. Um, I'd started working on their project. They'd signed a contract, but they hadn't paid their first invoice. And then the whole thing within a month, I'd done all of this work and hadn't been paid. And then they were like, actually, we're, we can't afford it. And it was just terrible. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have I don't know why I even worked without getting money first. So I remember that because I think... For example, I'm making something up. If they owed you five grand, I just said, call them and say, give me three grand now and we'll just leave it there. And we'll just, just smash walk. And grab. You like, did. Yeah. You told me that. And that was really good advice because I was like... Just get something from them. <laughs> seriously. So I... But to be honest, I've made that mistake a couple of times where I've worked, started working on something thinking, oh, it doesn't matter. I just want to get it started. They'll pay... Like I've sent them the invoice. They're going to pay me. Or they've signed a contract. They're going to pay me. Um, and... Sometimes that just – it's just not good business. So, that's one thing that you said to me. You were like, don't pick up a pen or a pencil or, or a, a mouse pointer, a right? mouse pointer <laughs> until you've been paid, yeah. until it's in your account and you can see it. And that, that for me, 
is really great advice. Yeah, and I think because it gets buy-in. You know they're not messing around. They're serious totally. about They want to engage. And yeah. even if it's a 20% deposit or a non-refundable $200 commitment fee, whatever that is in yes. your world, because you've all got different businesses, um, I think it's important. Now, I thought I would share uh, <laughs> the most banging mistake I made and I learned from. And I, I was approached. I've actually... The only money I spent in my last business um, for really marketing, apart from the odd little Facebook ad for some events and seminars we did, but for the actual business itself, I got an, and you've probably all, if you've been in business for more than 10 minutes, got a phone call from the companies that they do the real estate folders for. And they say, hey, you pay, we'll put your ad in the real estate folder. So when people settle on their home, the real estate folder, they've got all their documents and there's ads on the back. So the real estate don't have to pay for them. And I'm like, you know what? Stuff it. Let's give this a crack. And I just started my business. I had no money, but I thought, look, I'll do this. I'll put a grand towards it. And I'll I'll get you to put it up, Nate. There's a photo here of the ad. And this was my business, Fortify Financial, Protect Your Mortgage. And I was licensed by a company uh, that NAB Bank owned. And we actually... I, I went to the NAB's marketing team and they let me just chat with them. So we like protect your mortgage because I wanted to um, set people up with life insurance after they've purchased a house. And a year went on and I never got any inquiry from it. No phone calls. I'm like, okay, well, that was a waste of money. About three years after, I was looking through uh, the ad it, you know, you go through your old archives and stuff and you look at the stuff you did and I had a look and guess what? My number was incorrect. My phone number is incorrect. <laughs> now, the problem, there's a couple of things I learned from here. One, get someone to bloody proof your stuff and call the phone number. Uh, but two, and this is why when you're starting out, it's so important. And Laura's done this as well, you know, the good way. Don't borrow money to start your small business or side hustle, cash flow it. Because if I'd got a thirty or forty or fifty thousand dollar personal loan, I could have went, you know what? I'm gonna allocate five grand to this marketing. I would have spent five thousand dollars. So what the loan can do in your small business, it can amplify your mistakes and your losses. So yeah. for me that was just the biggest hilarious thing that I found out like two years later why they didn't <laughs> call. Uh, so there you have it. That's so, amazing. what I want to do now, I want to talk about, um, Lauren asked the question, how do you decide on pricing? I'm going to do kind of two or three slides and then I'll hand it to Laura for two or three slides and just put your hand up if you're, um, if you're loving life. <laughs> oh, no one's loving life. That's fine. Oh, yeah. We've got a few life lovers there. Actually, before I even go back to the slides, let's just launch another poll. How long have you had your business? just so we can kind of get a bit of a vibe for the room. And we'll leave this up for 35 seconds while I have a sip of licorice tea. How long would you say, Laura, that you've been kind of full-time in La La Social Club? Uh, I'd probably say... Be over two years, wouldn't it? I think it's four years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is really cool. So... Uh, three, two, one, and I'll show the results. So, okay, that's just cool. So 49% of you haven't launched your business yet. And I can say for, we'll just say half of the people watching, you're in the right place because you can really start strong. Um, 24% of people, uh, less than 12 months and then 12%, one to two years, uh, three to five years, another 12%. And there's a couple of veteran percentages in there, five to 10 years and over. So realistically, the stats are, if you can make it through the first three to five years, you've got um, a real chance of sticking around because whatever way you cut it, most of the research that I've read is businesses, will 75% of small businesses will fail within that three to five year mark. So for me, in my business, I really had that three-year milestone as a, all right, first hurdle. And then after the five years, I'm like, I'm staying here. So having said all that, what I want you to do, if we go back to the slides, I want you to work out if you're about to start your business or you're in business, be very clear on what you are and what you offer. 
and who you are. So what we've got here is a little matrix and you can take a photo or just remember this or watch it on YouTube later. And we're going to talk about a couple of different brands. So if we've got a high cost and excellent quality, we're going to have a look where brands sit. So if we talk about cars, you know, Rolls Royce might sit up there, you know, really high cost, excellent quality. We might take it down here and there might be Merck or BMW. Um, so then if we look at another brand, say it could be Hyundai. I mean, the quality is getting better, but the cost is, um, I might put that there, Hyundai. I can't even spell it. Um, <laughs> so I want you to realize or ask yourself, where is your brand going to sit when you start your business? And I'll give you another example. I'll use a different color. I reckon McDonald's, the hamburgers, the cost was pretty low and the quality was okay. Maybe McDonald's used to sit there, maybe. Then what's happened, we all know that the grills of the world and all those, you know, 12 oh, not $12, $18 burgers, you've got to mortgage your house to go and have a meal <laughs> at Grilled. Um, Grilled come in and said, we're going to kind of, oh, and hey, Guy, if you're watching, Guy's a manager at Grilled Sydney, he's a friend um, and listener of the podcast. Grilled are kind of like, yeah, we're going to be a bit more premium and charge more. Now, the interesting thing that I've noticed with McDonald's, they actually haven't, and it's really fascinating to watch, they haven't just gone we're moving to there. I believe what they've done is in the same store, we're having both offerings. So remember, you can go in and build your own bloody burger. So you can go to McDonald's and you can walk away with an $18 burger mm. or you can stick to the quarter pounder. Yeah. So I just want you to be very clear about where you sit on this. Can you think of another brand or two brands that are polar opposites? Two brands that are polar opposites. Um, I put you on the spot, didn't I? Oh, uh, I feel like someone that does that toes the line really well and is in a, a zone of their own. And I talk about these guys often is Koala mattresses yes. because their cost isn't super high, but their service. Um, I'm not sure if one of the things was service or their quality, uh, quality. is. is more on the so excellent you, side. Can you see that on the screen there, Laura? Yeah, I can see yeah. it. Yeah. Do you reckon Koala kind of sit there? Yeah. Where it's interesting, they've kind of beat the incumbents like your Sealies and all that yeah. stuff yeah. who are pretty much there. Totally, totally. But they've nailed it on the service. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's something that I think a lot of startups are in a position where we don't have to, um, we don't have to sacrifice the quality mm. Um, but we can still have it in an, in a competitive price point, yeah. depending on what your, um, what your offering yeah. is. So Lauren, when she said how to decide on pricing, I think to draw this yourself and actually work out where you want your business to be, or if you mm. are already incumbent in the market, work out if you're going to do a McDonald's and maybe offer two offerings or just move completely. Totally. And actually an example in my business is my one-on-one -on -one consulting is the, it's the higher cost yep. and the quality is, is higher. Yep. But then the things like the Canva packs and, and the course, they're a lower cost, but my goal is that they're still high Yeah. Well, quality, I, and but I, I think they're still over this threshold. At yeah, the but it's, there are so many ways to have this one-to-many, mm. um, similar to what you've done yeah. where where one-on-one -on -one financial advice versus not that what you do now is financial advice, but but having a podcast one to many, it's um, it just means that you can you don't have to hike up your price to deliver to more people. Totally. Now, on just finishing on this kind of diagram, I just want can everyone just if you, if that makes sense to you, can you raise your hand and then maybe just if we can test the chat. Um, and someone just put in the chat, like, yes or no, I, um, I, I vibe that. 
maybe the chat's... Oh, yep, yep. Hey, David. Uh, so the chat's working. Sweet. Vibing. Oh, so much vibing. Sounds great. <laughs> Love it. Oh, you wanted interactive webinar. You got it. Um, so as a, a real example for me, when I started my business, Fortify Financial, I went from... And Jason, if you're watching, who did the branding for Fortify Financial, my previous business, when I started, obviously no money at all. And realistically, that was in 2010. The technology that's moved in 10 years, I could have had so much more of a brand now, even with your Canva kit. Yeah, absolutely. And or at the very least consistently executed on it in your collateral without having – I still believe – I really do believe that getting your branding done by someone who is a graphic designer and an expert in – creating memorable brands that stick that is so valuable but in terms of implementing it in your social tiles because it, it's such a hungry beast you need to be creating stuff all the time canva is awesome for that because yeah. it just helps you implement it consistently now one thing i did so when i started i went from a a logo jason i want a logo this is what i want just make it i don't have time to spend five and a half grand with you making this big brand or whatever mm. Which kind of, you know, I always thought I did always have, um, I believe, excellence up here. Like I wasn't, you know, managing $8 million portfolios, charging, you know, 100 grand a year. Like I know advisors who have clients that pay 100 grand a year. I certainly was um, in the, you know, the good quality excellent, but I was in the lower cost. Mm -hmm. Now, what I did, this was my in initial logo here and... Behind my brand, I wanted like a castle turret and fortify financial. I wanted – my thing was I want you to um, – I want to build and protect people's wealth. I just want to help them build their wealth and I want to help protect their wealth and that's why I did fortify financial. And then I engaged Jason to do my full-on branding and if you need a brand done, I can introduce you. But – what he did, he actually turned this into a premium brand and it mm. stood up by itself. And then so he's got the shield there. So, you know, that's the protect. We've got the castle uh, because I still wanted the turret. Um, call me a, um, a monarch, whatever, or a monarchist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but whatever. And We'll call you queen. Yeah. And then <laughs> so he came up with like a tagline, securing your financial future. And basically overnight, whoops, I'll go back. Um, how do I go back? We go. Ugh. Sorry, guys. Overnight, I was able to move up into here and charge more. Hmm. And there was a whole heap of other engagement stuff that we did. So, I think brand is everything. It's perception and – but you've also got to deliver on the brand. Yeah. Now, my last little – couple of slides before we go. Uh, I'm having a shocker here. So I actually think there is three main stages to uh, any business cycle, okay? And I actually think that prospecting is a big stage, but, and I might get you, Laura, if I can put you on the spot, mm -hmm. because at all times in the business journey, uh, we've got to prospect and get clients. Then once you've kind of got them in the boat, you know, you've got them yep. on the hook, you've got them in the boat. We then want to engage them. Mm -hmm. So then, then they commit to your product or service. Then you want to deliver the product or service. Yeah. And then you want to keep them ongoing. If any, Even if it's a transactional client, mm -hmm. like Koala Mattress, I've bought one mattress. Yeah. And I'll go back to koala in five years. Yeah. How do I keep in the koala world yeah. ongoing? Yeah. Or if it's an accounting business, how do I keep, you know? So with prospecting, it's all about adding value. Talk to us, for example, how you've used like an ebook, for example, to show yeah. the value and yeah. Yeah. Um, so essentially the whole where brands really succeed now is by adding value to their customers and it's adding value to people before they're even a customer and that's where a lot of people will succeed in their online marketing and in their sales because the big thing the reason why marketing is so important in when you're building a business is because it drives revenue 
sales and marketing are the things that I think business owners need to be really good at because they're the things that actually make you money. Um, So it's really important that we get that part right. But the way that I have found it's been really successful for, for me and for the clients that I work with is by advertising a free piece of content. So it could be, hey, here's an ebook with five tips on how to do this, like five tips within your expertise. And advertising that gets people into your kind of, I'd call it maybe an ecosystem where they receive more, more kind of interactions, more valuable content from you. And the goal of it is not to ask for a sale straight away, but the goal of it is to actually build a relationship with this person. And the best brands, the best businesses, they actually make you feel like you're part of their their little crew and they build relationship with people. So that's what you want to be doing in your in terms of prospecting. However that looks for you, you really want to be engaging and getting as many people into that ecosystem as possible because the conversion rates are like are slim for a sale. So you you want to have as many people sitting there ready to buy from you in the future. And it can be a longer sales cycle. Totally. Now, if I go back to the diagram, I sound like a broken record sometimes, but once they are in the boat, okay, and I use the analogy, um, you're a baker, okay? Mm -hmm. You might be a, a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker. Once you have a client, okay, you are no longer a baker. You are no longer a butcher. You are now a small business owner and the baking has to take care of itself. It, it sits outside of the whole thing mm. because you're a business owner. Um, the baking sits out. The butchery sits out. You've got to be able to chop meat. You've got to be able to make candles in your sleep because you can't fight in front of the kids, quote unquote, your clients and be practicing your craft on your clients. So that stuff is hygiene. You've just got to be able to nail it. So if you're watching this, you're no longer a butcher, you're no longer a baker, you're no longer a candlestick maker. You are a small business owner and that's first and foremost. Mm. I think especially um, a lot of people who start creative businesses, so like photographers or people in the wedding industry or, you know, it, it might be a hobby that turns into a business. A lot of the time you can feel a bit like an accidental business owner and you're like, I never knew I had to deal, communicate with clients. I never knew I had to deal with complaints or handle my books and all those things. And so the skills you want to learn are the ones of how the heck do I run this business? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So I want to give a couple of examples before we move on, because we've got lots of questions and we want to make this interactive. And I can see Jessica's got a question there and we will get to that because that's awesome. Um, so as, as an example, I, I just... I'm big on customer experience. In fact, I've got this boat anchor here. I know that's not that one. This one here, you can't see it's glass. I won a customer experience award. I think there was 1,300 advisors in Australia and I won a customer experience award. We had an independent company research all our clients. Um, So I kind of, it's not my first rodeo in terms of customer experience and every time I go and experience a business, I'm always looking at that CX type thing. So I went to a fish and chip shop the other day, uh, prospecting's done. I'd walked past there a few times, knew they were there. Um, I sampled the products. Yeah. Someone else, you know, Nate bought chips one day. I'm like, yeah, that's nice. Okay. Engagement. So I make an order um, and they were kind of good. They said, oh, we're a bit busy. So I put the order in and then 50 minutes later, I had my chips, okay? Now, I get it, they're busy, but were they setting realistic expectations? So in that whole engagement piece, like, yeah, it was nice food, but I was pissed off because if they would have just said, hey, we're a 50-minute wait. So that's one part of it. (laughs) And like I was at the doctor's the other day, and if you run a medical practice, hello, maybe just a heads up when people are booking in, so you rock up, hi, I'm here to see doctor, whatever. Just say, hey, there's a 50-minute wait. Would you like to reschedule or come back? So instead of me sitting there pissed off, 
because the delivery of it's fine. Once once they deliver the service, it's good and they're medicos and all that. But how are you when you're engaging your customers, setting realistic expectations, getting back to them within, you know, I, I think with emails, particularly for prospects, one business day, if you're not responding electronically, even to say, hey, I've received your request, you're dead. Yeah, it's tricky as well. Like I think having... One thing for me with prospecting that's helped is having a CRM, so um, a customer relationship manager. So a program that actually says, okay, you've got this email. Like it actually has, we've got an automated email that we can send back right away because it's easy when you're busy and when you're the technician, you know, doing the actual work as well. It can be easy to miss stuff. And it's so important to get back to people quickly because the reality is people expect now, people actually on social media, if they're contacting you, they expect a response within within four hours. Totally. And that's actually the statistics. People are in their brains are like, I sent that restaurant a message four hours ago on Instagram. It might have been 10 p.m. By morning, they're expecting a response. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah. But if they res- get an autoresponder and set a realistic expectation, it can yes. soften the blow. Totally, totally. So... And then on, so all this is like ex- setting realistic expectations. Uh, and then ongoing, I use the example, you know, Qantas at the moment, they're not going too well. No airline industry is going that well. Mm. But to keep me, I guess, engaged in the brand, regular email updates, they've gone, hey, Glenn, we'll extend your status for an extra 12 months, no cost. Like, yeah. hey, we're, so I think it's just all about getting on the front foot communicating but not stalking like it's just that balance yeah totally so what we're going to do the giveaway tonight we're going to give away two things laura's going to give away one of her canva packs yes and i'm going to give away this book that changed my life i wish we could do a zoom um (laughs) so this will help you and laura's stuff because we know you guys are good at what you do but we need to help you attract more customers mm-hmm. and engage more customers because we know that you can chop meat. We know that you can make candles. Yeah. We know that you can bake. So it's mm-hmm. all about – and Laura said, oh, we need to kind of work out a kind of – we're trying to think of like what's one thing we can close this off with tonight. Yeah. But we kind of agreed that like if you segmented your business in that little X thing, if you just really intentional – Yeah. Um, knowing who you're not equally you're not. equally as much as who you, knowing who you are. I think that's super important. And I think as well, that book, I mean, I haven't read it and I definitely want to read it. But I think as well, like the reality is there are people, it's not actually about how talented you are. There are people who are way less talented who make way more money in business who totally. are far more successful because they communicate better. And yeah. it's so important in – in your own, like especially now, everything's online. You to cut through the noise. You need to communicate really well, and I think that's where having clarity around who are you even talking to. And I, I don't know if we'll even have time to get mm. to this, but having clarity around who you're talking to, who you are, who you aren't, that's really going to help you to cut through and and reach your customers and help people, which is the goal. Totally. So the premise of this book. Um, it's this cheeky acronym that they forgot an S, I guess, on purpose because it's also made it stick. Um, was in your marketing, um, make sure it's simple, unexpected, concrete, uh, which I'll talk about, credible, emotional and stories. And I look back and a lot of you who listen to the My Millennial Money podcast have heard me talk about my sound financial house. And I actually was using this for many, many years and, you know, as Laura said, there was more qualified, better financial advisors, advisors than me. But I know for a fact I was earning more than double than most advisors because I was very intentional. I had systems and processes. It was, um, it was just the client experience. We, we just nailed it and we knew what we were and what we definitely were not. So as an example, can you do something like this in your business? So... A lot of clients and customers would come to a financial advisor and say, I want to invest in the future and buy a share portfolio or an investment property. So I would get this out first meeting 
So first, it's simple. It's unexpected. Why the heck have you got a drawing up of a house talking about um, a budget and being debt-free with having an emergency fund when I just want to invest? It's concrete. So this book's amazing because it talks about talking in a language with your customers that's a schema that they understand. So like the diagram before where I use the X, a schema that we all understand that Mercedes is really expensive, Rolls Royce is more expensive, Hyundai is cheaper. So we understand that schema and that's why I use that example when drawing that for your business. So the schema of a house that the foundations go at the bottom Strong foundations, don't build your house on sand, that type of stuff. Credible, I would like to think I'm credible being a licensed financial advisor. Emotional, so there were spaces here where I could ask them like, what do you want to do? Like, what are your goals? It was like, oh, we want to get a helicopter license. We want to, you know, do X, Y, Z. So we make their thing part of this. And then stories. I used the story where I had someone, you know, who had three, four investment properties, but, you know, they, they still had consumer debt. They didn't have a proper plan and their, their life was a sham. So how can you communicate to your new clients, your, how do you engage with people so they get it? And one of the things in my business was we make the complicated simple. And it wasn't rocket surgery. Like what I did there. <laughs> I love what you did there. Mm. So now, Laura, there was a question here. And before we go to the next slide on the iPad, there's a question here from Jessica. And it's a really good question. Branding and coming up with a brand kit. So I'm going to have a drink of water because I've chatted. And we're going to give the iPad to Laura. The iPad, the trusty iPad. I've got lots going like on here. And again, everyone, if you open the Q and A window, and while law is while law is getting settled and organised, uh, I'm just going to put another poll up. And remember, open the Q and A window and just click the questions that people like, and the people who ask a question and it gets the most upvotes will win either this book or. Canva. A Canva kit. Yep. I okay, so we've got some upvoting happen. Remember to write your questions in there. How many employees have you got? We've got someone, excuse me. <laughs> that was weird. Did that come through? <laughs> the mic? Oh, I what kind of burped that? a little bit. Is that a burp? Yeah. Nice. I, I had a, a can of um, or a, a glass of Coke Zero. Did Coke, you? Coke, no sugar. Good um, idea. There's some, okay, you're going to end it in three, two, one. Sorry. Share results. How many employees do you have? Well, 78% of you said just yourself. And then we've got one, two, and then, yeah, there's a couple of people there with over, over 10 employees. Wow. So that's amazing. So cool. Turn this air con on a bit. Is it hot in here? Uh, I'm, I'm fine. I'm a bit worked up. So, Laura, yeah. do you want to go to your slide and yeah. talk to Jessica's question about branding and coming up with the brand kit? Yes, I love this. So... Big thing in terms of branding, it's not just your logo. It's not just your – it's not actually not even just your look and feel. It's actually – it's not just how the aesthetic and how it looks. It's actually about the brand message. It's about the voice. It's about your color palette, the typography or fonts that you use and the imagery that you use as well. So – when it comes to what actually creates a successful brand, there are a few components you really want to get right from the get-go. And the first thing I always start with is your brand message. The reason this is so important is because actually to cut through the noise, you need to have a clear, concise message. Where I see people go wrong with this is they, you know, and actually a lot of people in finance do this, <laughs> they'll be like, we do this and we invest in these portfolios that help you achieve X, Y, Z. And it's really like we help you accumulate wealth. Like who says the word accumulate ever no. in normal life? No one. No one says the word when accumulate. When I play Monopoly, I when accumulate you play, properties. Yeah, when you play Monopoly, <laughs> no one says the word accumulate. Super weird to say it in your brand message. We've got to make sure that our message and our language is actually really normal. The reason being 
if you can have your message, and I, what I'm talking about when I say your message, it's your kind of one liner. It's the catchy part of you know when someone describes you've got your business name, then you've got your your one liner underneath that. So for me, when I started La La Social Club, I was running it was social media management, and a lot of it was around how your brand actually looks. So I my tagline was helping people look, we help you look good on the internet. And the reason I knew that that worked was because it was in normal language. No one in marketing was saying, oh, we just help you look good on the internet, like interwebs. <laughs> like if I was one click away from being making it the interwebs. Um, it was normal language. It, ha- it was a little bit cheeky and people would introduce me and be like, oh, this is Laura. She helps people look good on the internet. Well, it's like the um, the success thing. It was um, unexpected. Yeah, exactly. I thought you were social media manager. Yeah, and it was just like, oh, people understood what the result was. Oh, I'm going to look good. I want to look good. Mm. Awesome. So, you know, we've got to be thinking, okay, can someone repeat this? So, super important. You want your message. You want to start with your message. How to do that? Um, you want to actually go through... Who am I? Who am I serving? What is the problem, and what is the result? Those are the three components that make up your brand message. So for you, you're making the co- you're making the complicated concepts simple. So the result is that things things are simpler for your audience, and your target market is millennials. So you want to make sure that that's really clear and concise. It could be repeated at a cocktail party, and people would know what's up. They understand it. Then you want to look at your logo. So you don't really want to look at anything else until you've got this brand message really solid, until you know what the result is of someone working with you. And if you sell candles, like it doesn't have to be grand and huge. If you if what you do is you sell products that help people, help people's homes to feel more relaxed or whatever it is, it doesn't have to be yeah. you're solving what What do you do for what, work? I don't sell candles. I make people's homes a, an experience or something. Yeah, something. exactly. I don't know, like. Exactly. I help people to be transported through <laughs> the scent of their homes or whatever yeah. it is. Like they feel like they're at a spa. I love that. I would totally buy that. So then you want to go onto your logo. And this is for me, I outsource my logo design and so did Glenn. I, I'm a big believer in outsourcing to experts on certain things. And I think your logo is probably one of those things. However, you can create your own in Canva. I love Canva. It's awesome. So you can do that yourself. The reason we want to get all of these components working is if one is missing, it's kind of like the wheels of a bike. If one is missing, it's just not going to it's actually not going to cut it and it's going to actually mean that your brand in one area suffers. So then we're looking at your color palette. The reason that color is so important is because that's how people remember you. So I think the stats are like 80% of recognition is on color. Mm. So people are getting, you know, I just on the way here, I listened to a statistic that was, we are inundated with over 5,000 advertisements every single day. So we've got to do everything we can to cut through the noise, to build trust and to be recognized and remembered. And that, my friends, is what color does. See, I don't like Coles because the red is too like aggressive. Yeah, so you're and a Woolies I guy. like Woolworths. It's green. It's light. I, I get that. I do get that. And I know where everything is at Woolworths at Badabu. <laughs> Bad over, yes. So that's the thing. Color plays such a big role in how people feel. Then what you're looking at is your typography. So your fonts. Um, you want to try to stick to consistent fonts, you know, as much as possible. That's where, again, Canva is awesome because you can actually do all of like these elements. These kind of all sit in that um, Canva land. Then you've got imagery. Now, the thing with imagery is that it actually communicates so much about your brand without using words. And again, attention spans are so little, we've got to do everything we can to communicate your message, to attract your audience um, in the shortest amount of time possible. So we're really wanting to use great high quality imagery that represents you know, who you are. Then your final thing is your voice. Now, this is how you come across. This is how you sound in your – it's not just 
on Instagram. It's actually how you sound in your email interactions with clients or customers, how you sound like how everything comes across the tone of your marketing in general. So, and the tone of your brand. And that's one thing with My Millennial Money. That was one thing that we worked on is that actually the tone of the Instagram, the tone of the social media and and all of your online marketing had to reflect the podcast. And the podcast is a bit tongue in cheek. It's, It's like, we're not taking ourselves too seriously. And you actually sat in the target demographic as well, which helped. Yeah. And so that's why the memes are awesome because it, it, it reflects actually, okay, what do people want to see? A non-stuffy version of helpful financial tips. And so it's really getting clear on how do I want this to sound and you know how do I actually consistently deliver that? So other thing is, on the voice thing, don't be afraid to inject personality into your brand. It's really helpful if you can do that. And a lot of people in bigger businesses, and you would know this, they're trying to come across as small and conversational and like you're sitting across the couch from someone. Bigger corporations are trying to achieve this, that small business owners, we have we have that in spades, you know, we can communicate in a really conversational, personable way because it's a luxury. Not all businesses have that luxury. So we've got to use that to our advantage Mm, for mm. sure. Do you want to, um, do you have another slide there? Oh yeah, I do. One more, I think. I think you did. Yes. Yes. Okay. So this was a question that we got. From Anmi. Anmi. I think. Annie me. And me. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. But the question was how to grow on Instagram having a really hard time. Um, totally feel you. Um, <laughs> Instagram is particularly for a lot of our age group and demographic, it's the place to be. Um, but I pulled up these two examples because these are just two – these are two Aussie businesses who have really nailed what I was talking about in the – Um, slide before the look and feel like the color palette you know even looking at boob to food the color palette is really clear like you when you see the blue and when you see that font you're like okay that's one of her posts you know she's doing these carousel posts which you do a lot in my millennial as well and it's really like um the whole her whole instagram feed is about adding value so, because she knows, because Luca from Boob to Food, she knows her target market really, really well, it makes creating content so, so much easier. So, again, Canva tiles, if you want to do these educational value add promo kind of tiles, they're awesome. Um, demonstrating your expertise in a really approachable way online. She always uses personal pronouns. So, she uses, she's like, I feel this, I learned this, and I'm showing you this. It's really, um, there's no royal we. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, that's a really good one. And then Jumbled Online is another one that I love. And she does, all of her photos are really, really high quality. And the colors are all really vibrant. Her tone in her captions, again, is really personable, really fun. And she is always showcasing other products that she loves. So it's a really great way to build your audience on Instagram. Um, And there's so much more I would love to say around growing on Instagram, but I don't think we actually have time. That's awesome. So I think, Laura, I think you've nailed it. Like it's all working together. Mm. It's like, don't do what I do first because I don't think I could have back then, but technology now would actually allow, and particularly your playbook online course, Mm. you know, how much is that? It's $447. Yeah. Yeah. So, under $450, bloody bargain. So, you could grab that, grab the Canva kit, well under $500, Yeah. you'd almost develop a business in a box ready to go. Totally, 100%. And, and a lot of that on how, how to grow on Instagram, I feel like, sorry, and I, mean, I didn't get to answer your question very much, but a lot of that we cover in the – And it's just about consistency. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. Now, there's a question here, and we will get into the questions. Um, I just want to answer a couple of – thanks. Right. A couple of questions – 
she was trash in the place. Um, I just want to uh, answer a couple of questions that we wanted to make note of, uh, and then we'll answer the Q&A ones, because we've got plenty of time, and thanks for hanging around. And just remember to use this time to think, what can I, what's one thing I need to do? Yeah. Like, what's one thing? Um, Palu asks, growing your brand, the distinction between brand and personal brand. Now, I'll be the first to say, my millennial money it's a it's a cracking brand there's it's got its own momentum it's its own thing they've like got the uh shell and m on careers we've got john but then there's me who i might do a campaign for a brand or something i'm struggling with it i don't know what the answer is um but i guess if you were starting laura what would you say go the brand way or go the person personality brand uh, I mean, I, one's harder to scale. Yeah, exactly. And one is – actually, I saw this thing from Samantha Wills and she ran this crazy um, jewellery company and she, obviously it was named after herself. And when she decided – she didn't want to sell it because it was her name. And that's where it gets a little complicated is if you're growing a business to scale and sell, um, then having your name attached to it, you know – that can have a lot of emotion and also it can kind of be a bit weird, someone running a business with your name on it. So what she did was she um, didn't sell the business, she just closed the business, but she did this post that kind of made it, showed how, how many years she'd been in business for and it kind of looked a little bit like an obituary. So people were Googling thinking she personally had died. And so she posted this thing recently, she's like, everyone thought I died because, because I closed the business and didn't sell it. So there is... There, you know, doing a personal brand, it is, you know, fraught with those types of things if you're using your own name. Um, for me personally, I I have dabbled in both and I have had to, with La La Social Club, I've just had to kind of go, this is me. Um, and people know that when they're talking to someone on my Instagram, it's me. Um, and... I tried to make it seem bigger than I was by kind of making it we and us and I found it just didn't work as well. So I tried to keep it as personal and, and as me as possible. Mm, yeah. It depends on your business. Really. Yeah, and I don't know if there's actually an answer. I think if you're in professional services or um, retail or something, I'd probably stick away from your own name because it's easier to scale if it does explode. Totally. But if you're maybe direct consulting or… Yes. Some an influencer online. Um, then your name works. And then your name is the name. So yeah. Yeah. there's a question here uh, from Jesse. Um, the art of cold emailing. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to press start and we're not going to spend more than 90 seconds on each question. We're Love just going to do rapid fire. Love it. Um, the art of cold emailing and making those meaningful business and people connections. Uh, my two cents on cold emailing is it's a shotgun approach. Yeah. Don't do it. <laughs> Maybe. I, yeah, I'm kind of with you on that. Although I've tried cold calling before and it also makes me feel so t just terrible. Yeah. Um, I think building relationship, a good way to do it on Instagram is, is engaging with their content, responding to their stories, open up a conversation that way. It might yeah. be a bit more organic. And one thing is a public service announcement. If you're cold calling or cold emailing, don't just go in the email. Dear Glenn, 20 paragraphs, regards, yeah. whatever. Don't just call me. Hey, Glenn, it's so-and-so from here. And then bleh, down the phone. Totally. Soft way, email, quick one-liner. Dear Glenn, I do this product. We've had these outcomes. Would this be of interest to you? Can yeah. we have a chat or a coffee one yeah. day? Let me know. Love it. Might do one follow-up. Phone. Hey, I'm from here. Is this something that I could talk to you about? Once yeah. you've got 10 minutes, when would it be a good time to call you back? Yeah, love it. So you're not just throwing crap down people's throats um, because it's that customer experience. Make it easy for people. Make it frictionless. Like mm -hmm. um, these are kind of two questions. Oh, that's good. We're, um, that was uh, basically uh, right on. Two questions. How do, how do you find your ideal clients and keep repeat business slash gain referrals for growth? 
that was from Katrina and Hannah asked, the best way to initiate contact if you don't have a client base. So what was the first question again? How do you find your, your ideal, ideal clients and keep repeat repeat business? Love it. Um, I I am really clear on who my ideal customer is. Some for some people, it's best to separate it into your products. So if you've got a number of products or services that you provide, for me, my online courses have a different um, ideal client to my one on one service. So getting clarity on on which is which. Um, in terms of actually identifying that, I think it's really asking the questions of who do I seek to serve? How do I help them? What are their problems, their goals and their values? And then you can define it from there. Yeah, I would say a couple of things. Make sure um, your customer or your client has a good experience. Okay. Mm. Then once everything's been put to bed, you could simply ask, hey, uh, I really love working with yes. you. Yes. Who else is in your world that I would be able to help? Would you help facilitate an introduction? Yeah. It's simple as that. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's kind of Katrina with gain referrals for growth, like total organic growth. Love it. Um, Hannah, best way to initiate contact if you don't have a client base. The first year in my business, I made the decision I'll never cold call somebody out of the phone book or whatever saying, yeah. hey, it's Glenn James, I'm financial advisor. Never, ever wanted to do that. Mm. I spent the first year cold calling and emailing other businesses, mortgage brokers, accountants, solicitors that could I could form a relationship with so they could send me clients. So I yeah. spent my time prospecting other businesses that could send me clients. Yeah, So love it. How, how do you do that? Um, Sam asks, how would attracting an ideal client um differ in a b2b context i'm not sure it would differ whether it's no. b2b or b2c no i don't think it no from my experience uh, most of my work is b2b and it's pretty well the same yeah um your your advertising approach might be different you might get into networking groups or facebook groups are really good for that as well um you know to actually i guess reach more people who run businesses yeah yeah, sweet. Cindy, and these are kind of two questions. Cindy asks tips on branding hat or merch from the crowd. Well, one, made to stick. Hmm. Read that three times a day. Like just read it. <laughs> and there's another book that's an old favorite from Seth Godin called Purple Cow. And that kind of based on the premise that you're driving through the countryside, there's cows everywhere. Yeah. Um, you don't really pay attention to what it feels a purple cow. Yeah. Like you would. Um, so I think it's just that don't use language. I never said in my business that, hey, come for financial advice. Yeah. So on the side of our building, we had a sign. It did not say financial advisor within. It said, I even forget, but it says, we help you have a secure financial future. Yeah. Or something like that. Just like. The result. Yeah. Yeah. Lead with the result. Yeah. I love it. Um, Rebecca asks websites, and I'll just start this just in case. Do you get it done yourself or do you do it yourself or should you pay for somebody and how much should it cost? Um, that is such a good question. I am a huge fan. You know, a lot of what I talk about with my courses and training is helping people to DIY their marketing, pretty much anything that like giving you skills to actually do it yourself. Squarespace is awesome. If you're going to do it yourself, I highly recommend Squarespace. Um, in fact, maybe what I'll do, Glenn, is I'll send through a bunch of the tools that I use because we've got an ebook that has literally all the programs we use for everything. So you can DIY all the things. Um, Squarespace is awesome. You, you either spend time or money. So you either outsource it, spend money, Sp spend yeah, but time. if I spent time, it would still look like crap. So I've yeah. had to outsource. Yeah. So if you if you um, aren't skilled in that area, honestly, it is so much better to just get someone else to do it. There are some great Squarespace designers. And you should not be paying more than five grand, I would expect. Not for – like unless you're a significant e-commerce kind of thing and Shopify is the way to go for that. Mm. Like you don't need a custom site. You can use a template site. You can get really beautiful ones. And yet I agree. I don't think anyone should be spending 10 grand on a complicated website. That's my 
thing. I've seen people spend 15 grand and upwards on sites that don't even work anyway. A um, bit of fun. We've got a poll here just to break the mood. What do you enjoy least about your business or what you think do you suck at? So, so here's some interesting ones. So, we're just everyone wakey-wakey, have a read. What do you not like doing or what do you suck at? And I think Love you can it. only answer one. You might be answer, able to answer more than two. So, there's this for the options for those who can't see it, working with clients. And some people like hate, like they might have started a plumbing business. It's like, oh, I hate going to site and dealing with people. Mm. I just want to employ plumbers now. Um, yeah. Managing staff. Oh, I'm bad at that. Back-end processing, bookkeeping, branding, website design, getting new clients, uh, B2B relationships. And three, two, one. I'm going to end the poll now and share the results. So, yeah, 37% of people said they suck or they don't enjoy getting new clients. Uh, The next one was bookkeeping, 26%. Get a bookkeeper, everyone. Just oh, get yeah. a bloody bookkeeper. They're they're not expensive. Um, that was the best thing I ever did, yeah. I reckon. So I used to spend once a fortnight on a Saturday in my office doing MIOB. Yeah. Um, I just it it sucked the joy out of my life. <laughs> uh, Back end processes. Oh um, yeah, that's my least favorite. Design, branding, and websites. Seven percent of people. So getting new clients. I think if you did focus double down on B2B relationships, how to get out there more, it might be doing an online course about Facebook ads. Yeah. Um, just be really clear on what you are and what you aren't. Uh, but I, I would say, how can you outsource the things that you suck at? Um, and how would I outsource getting new clients? Well, what I did in my business, I went to other businesses and got them to send me clients. Yeah. So the clients would automatically come. Yeah, that's so good. So. I think also have it building your email list is a big one. Building an audience that you own so that when you do have new products or you do have new services, you can actually – you've got a list of people ready to buy. I – just on the website thing, I don't know if you would agree with me, Laura. I think 10 years ago I was saying to people like websites are dead, Facebook groups or Facebook pages are everything now because everyone's on Facebook – I would say it's the other way now. Facebook's dead. Um, You need a good website. I think the only audiences you own are your email list and your website audience. And that's it. So building your Instagram, you know, building your audience on Instagram, but driving them to your website, driving them to your email list. Same with Facebook groups, driving them to your website or email list is the way to go because you can then talk to those people directly. There's no algorithm in between you. And, and this is the thing, like you might be the butcher, you might be the baker, you might be the candlestick maker. They're not really, their service type product or the product business mm. a, lot of, a lot of the time that, well, I don't need stuff on Instagram. I don't need stuff online. Yeah, yeah it's right. You don't, but every business now is an online marketing business. Mm. By the way, we sell... Yeah. Resolves by the way we sell candles. Yeah, exactly. So I think everybody's got a shop in their pocket. How do you be in front of people? Yeah. Send them to your local butcher. And yeah. there's a question here, and I'll ask it. It's it's the top one. Jessica De, La- De Leon. Apologies if I haven't pronounced your name. And it's the most upvoted. Uh, what are some ways to add value for free? when you are offering a product rather than a service. My business is in retail, for example. Now, the first thing I'm going to say there is experience and like how many, we went somewhere today, I did in Newcastle and it was like I was annoying the shop attendant. Yeah. Like, oh, sorry, do you mind if I ask you a question about this product? Mm. Or am I putting you out? <laughs> but yeah. it's like, no, it's their bloody job yeah. to serve me. So I would say the first thing, if you're in that retail space, it's got to be about experience. How do you make people feel welcome? How do you make people feel? It might be like, 
have some bloody nice incense, or not incense because it makes me sneeze, but how do you get a nice <laughs> A nice candle. A nice candle. Yeah. How do you set the lighting so it doesn't look like hell with fluorescent lighting? Yeah, exactly. How do you change the one percenters? Yeah. Because I'm big on one percenters. Yeah. You change enough one percenters, you're getting to 100. Yeah. I think as well, like offering incentives like free free shipping or free, you know, if you're in a store like a brick and mortar kind of thing, if you you know, homeware stores that do free gift wrapping, like that's a really good value add. The other thing I think is you can't underestimate ease of use for people. That's a really good value add. So for instance, I have a coffee subscription. I get coffee delivered to my like as in beans delivered to my door every two weeks. What I would love is if the coffee roaster, if the company were like, hey, we reckon you're almost out of filter papers. Here's, we're going to add it to your order. We're just going to ch- like, are you happy if we just add it to your order and charge you for it? I'd be like, oh my gosh, thank you. Because I would be so frustrated if I didn't have filter papers to make coffee. So little things like this where you can kind of go, oh, you're probably out of this. You probably probably run out. It might be good to top up. Yeah, and I think it's that friction thing. Yeah, make it easy. Make it so easy. Remembering, um, even in Shopify, what they do really well is remembering your card details, remembering your address, anything that just takes out any of those extra steps for people. Jessica, if you are still watching, just in the chat, just so if you wouldn't mind, can you uh, can you let us know what your retail business is because we might be able to just workshop. Yeah. So I've got a few things in my mind that we can workshop. David asks, um, how do you move away from the initial low cost service you charge at the start of the business to a more premium service slash fee? And Jessica's answered, so we'll get back to her. Um, but yeah, so how do we basically move from low cost to premium? I know exactly how I did it. Mm. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, I think for me- two minute timer. I think I think for me, a lot of it was a mental thing, actually. I had a business coach who really helped me to um, actually see the value in what I offered um, and help other people to see the value. It's really hard to sell something if you don't like a premium high ticket item, if you don't see the value in it yourself. So I think that was a big thing that I had to work through as well as mindset and mentally going, right, I'm going to double my prices and see what happens. Yeah. And actually, people people were more likely to buy it, which is, yeah. So good. Um, what I would do, uh, David, and I did this myself, um, you basically may have a period of time or forever that you price discriminate. And what do I mean by that? Well, I fly to America or Melbourne or whatever. I might pay, I'll make a number up, $1,000 for my ticket. The person next to me, got their seat on sale for $500. So the airline has price discriminated. It's legal, okay? It's not legal in some businesses and all that stuff and collusion, but just go with me. When I transitioned from um, my lower, cheaper brand to the premium brand, I actually in the background just segregated. So all new clients pay the premium and I was kind of running company one and Newco. I just called it Newco in the background. So I still have clients Well, I, I merged the business, so I'm no longer in the business, but 10 years into the business, I still had such quality clients that were with me from day one and they trusted and believed in a 25-year-old idiot. I'm the idiot. If you're 25, you're a lot smarter than I am. But when I look back, I was like, what the heck am I doing? They trusted me and I I'm like, you know what? I'm totally thankful that they were with me. Mm. But new client, you're not paying, I'll make a number up, $1,300 a year ongoing. You're paying $4,000. And yeah, there might be times where you slowly ratchet those older clients up, but you can't turn around to a client who's been paying X and go, oh, by the way, slap in the face because I figured I would rather keep the client at a smaller amount. That's just part of life, part of my growing business. And then I've... Like Google, if you use Google, like G Suite, or I think they call it now G Suite, Mm. Google Mail, I've still got a G Suite account that I'm not paying for because I was one of the first to use it. Where if you log in now, it's like $10 a month a user. So Google have even done that. So that's my two cents on that. Now, Jessica, she says, 
her, she's got an online business selling clothes. So what about this, Jessica? This is my first thing. How do we add value at a low cost? In the checkout or whatever, um, if you grab their phone number, what if, and it's that surprise and delight thing. What if you just set a threshold? Anyone who spends over a hundred bucks, they either, they, I'll send them a phone. Oh, and you gotta, you gotta do this dance with scalable and wow. Yeah. Whether it is, I'm going to call you personally and say, hey, thanks for the order, I appreciate it. Are we all good? Or it might be you send them a personal text. Hey, it's Jessica from whatever. Yeah. And you could even automate some of that stuff in the background. Well, there's also so much power, in, particularly in e-commerce, with a handwritten note. Totally. You know, like it takes you an extra two minutes, if that, to just say, hey, thank you so much from one small business owner to you. I just want to say thanks. I think that type of thing is is really, really valuable. Also, could you send them, email them a $25 off voucher for the next time they purchase? Like there are other ways you can add value and automate that yeah. that's scalable for yeah, sure. Because in my business, I I kind of joke around and say the back end was a sausage factory, but the front end, everyone felt like they were my only client. Yeah. And that's because I had lean, automated, personalized emails. The automated emails, it wasn't dear Governor Trevor or dear yeah. Dame Mary, kind regards, Glenn James. It was, hey client at the end cheers so yes. it felt personal yeah. now these mugs i wanted some nice ceramic mugs if you look them up on instagram they're called ghost uh ghost wares i think or just go to instagram ghosts now i ordered two and it they weren't cheap they were like um i think 38 dollars or 30 dollars a mug mm. right and open up, there was a card, hey, we hope you enjoy this. Then I'm like, okay, I want to double down. My next order, I ordered like $980 worth of ceramic because I wanted like nice stuff. And then, hey, handwritten, hey, Glenn, thanks for the ongoing support. Yeah, love it. So, it's not hard to... It's not hard to build super fans. Like That's right. And can... just that little one percenter. Yeah. yeah. I surprised once, I and it cost me a fair bit... I got some battery um, iPhone chargers or whatever they are, the battery packs, and it had Fortify Financial, my brand name. And then I got a nice card and it was had the foils and, and it said, and I kind of remember exactly what it said, and this cost money because I, I made the decision I want to spend 5% of, I think, my turnover, or it was a low amount, I forget, back into it. So we did movie days for clients. Mm. We hired the movie cinema and we... You come and take your kids and all that and yeah. you get clients from it. But I, on the card, it was a premium card. I said, hey, whether we see each other regularly or not, I just want to say thank you for being a client of mine. Nice card, battery pack, express post. I think we sent out 200 of them. Mm, and that was it. that surprise and delight. Yeah. And it just... You've got to not be afraid to invest back into your business. Even if you said, we're going to spend 5% of any revenue, put it in a separate account to spend back on our existing customers mm. because that's the best way to get new customers is existing customers because yeah. if you target doctors, I can tell you now all doctors, all they've got as friends are other doctors. Yeah, <laughs> like, totally. So I'm ranting but hope that helped Jessica. Um, another question here from Laura, how do you manage your time when you have a side hustle and grow into a full-time job whilst working and studying already? Should there be certain things that we prioritize? Well, you did this exactly. And I'm going to put three minutes on the timer, Laura, <laughs> to, for you to tell us how you time manage your life. Um, do you know, uh, yeah, so I worked for another company doing their marketing and they and then I worked a couple of days on my own business while it was while I was building it. Um, big thing that I found helpful is, and actually I do this now, is actually theming my days. So if I knew, okay, I've got two days where I'm working, like I'm in the office, like not 
not business. I'm I'm employee land. Um, then the other three days, I really tried to theme those days. So one of those days might be, okay, I'm doing client work this day. The next day might be, I'm taking sales calls. I am responding to inquiries. I'm networking. I'm, I'm jumping into Facebook groups and I'm commenting and engaging to try and build my um, audience and also get new clients. And then maybe the third day could be like, actually, I'm going to work on marketing myself, marketing my own business. So theming my days has been a big game changer. Um, I really love, um, it's called Full Focus Planner and it's by Michael Hyatt and he's really good, um, really clever with goal setting and it really plans your whole week, plans your days. You can set like startup rituals for your day, end of day rituals so that you really are separating, especially if you're working from home, separating that um, work time and, and home time. I think they're the big ones for me in managing my time. That's awesome. And thanks, Jess, um, for acknowledging that we answered your question. She said, amazing, guys. Thank you so much. And I can't help. I just, I'd love to just do more on Jess. But like, what if you bought a lower cost little gift and every package over fifty dollars, there was something extra. Yeah, I love it. Like, yeah, there is so much you can do. Like, even a little um, greeting it, card, like greeting a, card. a beautiful, like if it's showcasing another brand or something like that. Like, a little sample of something else. Yeah, that and could be cool. Just put your website in the chat, just so everyone can jump on and have a look. Because love I just it. think like it's so easy to, and this is the thing, Laura. Like. It's so easy to wow people mm. with basic stuff because so many companies and businesses don't. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's so easy. Yeah. Like, and again, Jessica, you're not selling clothes. You're giving people confidence and image. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Um, there's another question here uh, from Kelsey. Uh, what are best apps slash software to use to schedule social media and auto replies to DMs? I don't know if I like auto replies to DMs. Yeah, I um, yeah, I was someone did that to me the other day, and I was a bit like, oh, like what? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I get it. I do get it. Uh, quick replies, I definitely prefer. So in Instagram, um, quick replies are a good way of still keeping it personal. Um, you've still got to manually respond, but you can pre-fill your response. I kind of like that better. It feels a bit more personal. Um, scheduling apps I love. And again, I'll, I'll send you the um, marketing tools that I use. Yeah, we'll email it out the link yeah, tomorrow. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Um, I love Later uh, because it's visual. Um, it's a really good tool. Buffer is really good because it does LinkedIn as well, which is really handy. Um, LinkedIn is a great tool for people to be using for marketing. Um, and really still you can get some organic reach on LinkedIn still, which is awesome. And Pinterest is another big one. Um, they're the big ones I love. Planoly is good, super visual as well, great for Instagram, um, but my go-to is later. Mm, love it. Um, we're going to do one last poll for the night. And also there's uh, Jessica's website there. If she, They're in the process of relaunching this week. David, was that helpful as well? And Jessica or David – Write what you want, either the book or Laura's course, because you are the, um, the yeah. Um, and then someone as uh, Ina said, agree with Laura and Glenn. Best to reply directly rather than auto. Best way if you want to make it faster than set up keyboard shortcuts for message template. That's cool. Um, so let's do another poll. I like this, and I think you can only answer once. If you were giving 50K tomorrow, and I want you to answer this as well, Laura, to spend on your business or to start your business, and Jessica's going to get the book, love it, um, what would you spend it on in your business? So, would you buy 50K worth of stock? Would you buy 50K work, worth of marketing and advertising? Would you buy 50K worth of equipment? Would you employ staff? Would you use back-end systems and processes? Uh, would you redo a fit-out? Um, so there we go. Uh, we'll end it in 10 seconds. Marketing, advertising, or website is in the lead at 35. Backend systems and processes at 22. That 
that's not that expensive. Like if we talk about mm. everyone is an online marketing business, mm. um, I think we both use Active Campaign. Yeah. And it's actually a little bit expensive. <laughs> but, but you know what? If you if you're using Mailchimp, it's not it's not that different. Once you have to go into if you want automations in Mailchimp, this is a technical thing, mm. you end up paying this pretty well the same amount. So yeah. I feel like it's so much better than MailChimp, honestly. If yeah. you want to automate some of this those wow moments, then seriously. Yeah. It's so good for that. Yeah. So I would really encourage everybody. Um, so yeah, the biggest answer, thirty six percent people would spend on marketing, advertising and or a website. And then 21% on back-end systems and processes, stock to sell. Um, what would you drop 50K on in your business at the moment? Uh, Director's fees? I th- yeah. <laughs> Owner drawings? Yeah. No. <laughs> I think um, I would do marketing and advertising. Yeah. Just because I think it makes you money. I think I would as well. I mean, if someone rocked up with 50K... I would just go hardcore on um, online Instagram marketing and all that. Yeah, I agree. Just because Setting up courses, like those things that kind of keep selling. Yeah, and I guess money. in the five minutes we've got left, like you might have a bricks and mortar butcher shop and but I still want to encourage you, why can't you have an online CRM? Why can't you? Totally. Because if you don't, the butcher Someone down the road does. might. And there's a butcher and our my brother-in-law and your really good friend, Chris, he spends so much money at, a, at the butcher across the road and he loves it. He started smoking all these meats. But honestly, if they said if they sent him an email and now my husband's into it, if they sent him an email going, hey, this is what we've got on this weekend. We reckon you're going to love it. 100%. Nath would buy it. My husband would buy it. Chris would 100% buy it. Like if you just personalize the experience and go, hey, we're helping you out. We know you you probably mm. need some. People will be like, great. Yeah, I do. Thanks for reminding me. There's a question here from Emma Bruce. Um, what do you wish you knew when you started your business? Um, do you know what? I think... The skill that I – actually, the skill that – the training that I'm going to get next is communication. Right. I think people who can communicate clearly and people who are really great at dealing with people and and really outlining expectations, as you said before, they, they sell things. They are – People find what they say compelling. I think mm. communication is one thing that I'm like, man, I wish I had that. I had it nailed and I still have so, so much to learn. So, that's yeah. a big one. I, I think I would probably would have went to that um, commitment fee first in my service-based business. Yeah. And then also, uh, I wish I knew that when I started my business that I don't have to deal with people that are painful and a soul Oh, my gosh. We were going to talk about this in, yeah, in not how to not get the wrong customers yes. because you can get loads of customers, but some of them can suck. <laughs> oh, I had people abusing me. And it's yes. like, I, I don't, like I own this business. My name's on the door. Like, yes. so I think it's like, it goes back to um, you can actually, and it could be in your language. So if you want to engage a client, hey, let's have a chat to see if we're a right fit or let's have a Love chat it. to see if I can point you in the right direction. Yeah. And then you can straight up say, hey, can't do this. And you're qualifying them as well. Like it's it's got to go both ways with – or I think as well for me, I even had this realisation at the beginning of this year. I was like, these people are a wrong fit. And sometimes you don't know until you do it. And honestly, sometimes you have clients that you're like, oh, that wasn't a right fit for them and it wasn't a right fit for me either. It would have been awesome if like I had the – confidence and also intuition to know that from the get-go i guess you get good at recognizing the flags and triggers that make you go oh that that's probably not going to work for us yeah uh look there's lots of questions here i'll just keep (laughs) scrolling down because we've got a couple of minutes um actually before we do that i'm just going to go back to the ipad um it's my pencil here it is stop looking (laughs) 
found it, everyone. Um, so I think we were kind of thinking um, all the questions tonight. These are kind of the things that we want, and I added the last one, but be intentional with what you want to build. Talk to us about showing up and remembering it's about people, Laura. Oh, yeah, this is a big one. I just think for small business owners, we've got to remember that it is – we're there to serve people and we're really there to help people. And I think if you genuinely want to do that, you really have the like set up – you're really set up to succeed, um, especially on social media. If you want to do well, keep it about people. Remember that it's a relationship building platform. That's where I see a lot of people go wrong. Um, I think keeping it, keeping it relational, keeping it personable in all the aspects of your communication, really. Yeah. I lost my train of thought. What were you saying about um, keeping about people relational? Uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> Don't and this is important as well. Don't be afraid to test, learn, tweak, and just kind of try it. Eh, it didn't work. Come back. Like for example, my thousand dollars that I spent on the ad, I eh, tried it, didn't work. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> like and you just and it's okay. It's also I feel like success is made up of lots of mini failures and some big failures that lead you to a better spot where you're like, oh, this is my zone and this is this is awesome. So. I think done is better than perfect. That's the other one. Mm. You don't have to have all your ducks in a row to start. So anyone here who is doing their side hustle, just keep plugging away at it. Don't feel the pressure to quit your job overnight. You mm. can do both for do both for a while. It's great. Like you can balance both and then, you know, when you're ready to take the plunge, it's going to be awesome. So I think just to be encouraged that we're all learning on the go and you don't have to have it all, yes. <laughs> all sorted. And Steph asks, where did you get your first client or customer? Well, before I um, jumped ship, I couldn't actually run a side hustle with being a licensed financial advisor. I actually lined up 10 clients and people that I knew and said, hey, it'd be like if you want to start a building business, line up 10 patios or whatever you're building, then quit, then straight into it, for example. So I lined my ducks up through people that I knew Um I did the same. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Nath, if you just want to put up that slide, uh, Jessica's website didn't come up for us. Um, I'm going to do a copy and paste. It's in the chat. Jessica's website is snostore.com, snowstore.com. And then also in the chat, I've sent a link to Laura's Canva um, content. So make sure you click on that, grab it. I mean, you two people go out to grill. It's forty dollars. So spend thirty seven dollars oh, yeah. on your business. Wine. Yeah, a cheap bottle of wine, or is that expensive? I don't drink. Uh, that's kind of that's yeah. kind of average. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, there you go. So, and there is a link if you want to take a screenshot of this, and if you go to that website there, um, you can. Grab Laura's online course. Hundreds of people have done this course and I don't know if she's got any bad feedback yet. No, I, I, well, <laughs> not, that anyone's, not that anyone's shared with me. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll make sure that I send over some of those, that ebook with all of the tools and, and programs because I think that'll help you guys as well. Yeah, and if you want to... Um, like if you do want to chat with Laura or connect or ask her something, I don't know, she might be able to send you something or connect you with somebody. Um, LalaSocialClub.co forward slash contact. Um, you've been great. I've been Glenn James. You've been Laura. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs> and if you can please, um, let's just give a raise of hand if you found that valuable um, and thought that you got at least one thing. Chris Foote, how are you, mate? Um, it's a cousin of mine. Um, <laughs> yeah, so plenty of hands raising there. Um, and everyone, just while we're still here, uh, we're right on nine. Everyone, if you're brave enough to write in the chat, what's one thing you are going to implement in your business? Oh, and Jessica, um, can you send me, uh, just Instagram me uh, via DM, uh, my millennial money, your postal address, 
And David, I'll track down your email from the thing and we'll connect it with Laura and she'll give you the, the Canva thing. Um, yeah, Victoria is going to, uh, let's read these. Uh, Lauren is going to do multiple pricing options. Uh, Victoria is going to theme her days. Yeah. Um, in a, sorry if I haven't pronounced that, need to implement third-party marketing. Um, and just on that multiple pricing options, I had in my business, um, when I took people through the journey, had like four packages, you know, really high, really low, and just kind of, you kind of reference them to the one. like, And then we had a badge on it that was like um, most bestseller or most popular, most popular or, yeah. or something like that. You're so, using those other prices to anchor yeah. the real one you want people to buy. Um, love it. Yes, I love what Monique said. Um, I'm determined to use a percentage of profits to better brand the business. Love it. Love Laura that. said, be more specific about who my customers are so I can nail my brand identity. Love it. Love Janet it. said, I'm going to get a business coach so I can come more comfortable with charging high fees and knowing my worth. And just Woo. on that, and I know if you need to go, please, but I just, there was a question. I don't want to keep you any longer. Um, and also, we're going to send out a, a survey tomorrow uh, via the Zoom follow-up uh, thing. Uh, so, can you please give us anonymous feedback of the webinar? Um, Liam asks, and it kind of ties into Janet's thing, how to overcome the challenges of being a young professional that are removing the stigma around age and years of experience. I, when I was 26 years old, I got a referral to a doctor. He was a specialist specialist to do his insurances. He earned $2 million a year. $2 million a year as a specialist, one of the best in Australia at his thing. And I know because I Googled the crap out of him. I was scared crapless. What did I know? At the time, I had orthodontics because I had my teeth fixed. <laughs> and I was freaked out, freaked out. But guess what? He knew nothing about insurance. I was the professional in that setting. And I knew nothing about being a specialist in whatever. So, it's a mind game confident you you can nail it you are the professional in that situation uh jason's going to cl get clearer brand messaging uh, and there was one more that i didn't read kelsey said use your diagram diagram to help knuckle down pricing um hey guys thank you so much um please fill out the feedback form thank you laura you've been great Bless you. Bless thank you. you. <laughs> Bless you. And thank you to everyone. We appreciate your time. We've had a lot of fun. And we'll see you tomorrow morning if you listen to the podcast. Woo! Woo!